Welcome to the course, uh, Environmental Impact Assessment. Uh, and today we are going to look at methods used for coastal ecology and uh, to assess geomorphology. So we'll uh, look uh, particularly uh, the segments of impact prediction and evaluation. So accordingly, our coverage we will uh, cover like we'll look at uh, different sources and types of impact for uh, use for coastal area. And then we'll look at the methods for impact prediction and assessment in this domain. So accordingly, our learning outcomes will be that after completion of this particular session, you should be able to identify different uh, sources and types of uh, impacts for coastal areas. And then you should be able to identify and select methods of impact prediction and assessment. So we're not going to get into a to extensive details of the methods, but we'll look at what are the different methods which are available for the domain. So the key reference for this uh, particular session, uh, for this particular theme is uh, chapter 7 from the course book which we are referring, Methods of Environmental and Social Impact by Therubal and Bud. And we are also looking at uh, the manual by Ministry of Environment. So, uh, in this, we are looking at the manual, which uh, is particularly for the ship breaking yacht, so, so somewhat it relates to the coastal area. So we'll be looking at that as well, and then we'll, I'll be also linking some of the case studies for your reference, uh, which you can further use for detailed understanding. So uh, when we look at impact prediction, the key approach which we identify for impact is like uh, uh, we uh, undertake consultation, we undertake consultation with public, we take consultation with uh, uh, marine users and the regulatory authorities. And uh, we undertake a review based on the survey data and then we also look at similar cases, references, analogous cases from where we can refer that what has happened in the previous cases and what is likely to happen in your particular case, the project which you are for which you are preparing the impact assessment. For coastal ecology, a structural approach is required because uh, one, as we have already seen in the previous session, that the geomorphology and the processes involved are very complex. So uh, we need very structured approach, and. Uh, for this, as, as per the textbook, what we see by Terrible and Wood, it is suggested that one needs to undertake assessments separately for hydrodynamic effects. So what kind of effects would happen to the water environment? And uh, the other, you would also look at the ecological impacts. So uh, what impact would happen on the ecology? So these two segments, you look at it differently and you look at it in a very structured manner. And if you take note, there's the difference between the terms used. You will see that hydrodynamics effects and then the other is ecological impact. So when we say that, that there's a difference uh, between that because uh, any change in the hydrodynamic would not necessarily mean impact. So there might be changes, but it would not have any kind of adverse impact on, on the ecology or, or the environment. So uh, one needs to understand what kind of changes are happening. That's why the term is used effect. But then because of that or otherwise, what kind of impact might happen on the ec ecology? So that uh, one needs to understand the difference between the two. Further, uh, one, uh, when, we, when we say that it has to be taken in a structured approach, then we see that one needs to identify the effects and potential impact as phase one. Then one needs to describe different effects and impacts. So we have been seeing that you undertake baseline assessment, then you describe it, and then you assess those uh, effects and impacts, and then um, you derive the impact significance. So we are going to look at how you assess the effects or impact, and then how do you really derive the impact significance.
just to quickly look at what are the different sources of uh, uh, impacts in the coastal area. So one of the major cause what we see is the urban or the industrial or the commercial development along the coastal areas. So th they are seen as causes of impact and then the kind of impact which it has, it is like it creates like increase in water temperature at least at the local level and that would have a secondary impact like it would change the biota of the area. And then uh, it, uh, the same things could also change the, uh, could lead to habitat loss, it could also lead to fragmentation, it could also lead to damage of the lateral and sublateral uh, areas which we had already seen in, in, in the previous chapter. And uh, this might happen because of uh, occupying the land for a certain development purpose and then also changing the drainage pattern, what kind of pattern you are developing and that might also lead uh, to certain like uh, uh, blockage or uh, creating of the of creating a situation which might lead to flooding or creating situation which might lead to erosion or create disturbances especially for birds. So urban industrial and commercial development kind of land use uh, changes which happens can also create these kind of uh, impacts. And then uh, when you look at such kind of land use change, especially when urbanization takes place, you also notice that there is uh, increase in the runoff, including like you might uh, also see flash floods where, uh, where like rapid water would accumulate, uh, accumulate, so it would lead to flash floods during these storm periods. And then you would also see soil erosions which would further lead to like uh, would have another uh, secondary impact like suspended sediments, uh, load would increase and that would lead to uh, increasing sedimentation in the estuary system and then further that would uh, you would be required to remove that by dredging and you might need to regularly maintain that for the navigation purpose. So those kind of impacts are also seen and then you would also see in the nutrients and toxic pollutants coming from the urban areas, again loading the estuaries and the marine water. Uh, further, we, uh, you can also see um, bioaccumulation of toxic pollutants. Uh, uh, bioaccumulation, if you remember we had studied about bioaccumulation of the toxic pollutants by the coastal and marine organism and uh, th this would also happen which would again have impact on the uh, uh, organism as well as on the uh, human health. So it would have impact on the physiological, ecological impact as well as impact on the human health. So that can also happen and then um, even a eutrophication would happen because of the sewage effluents from the urban areas and uh, which might impact the estuarine and near shore coastal waters. So that would also happen. You have also, we have already seen eutrophication so I will not cover that in detail here. Further, uh, the nutrient inputs. Uh, like uh, uh, above certain extent would also lead to oxygen dis depletion and that might also lead to uh, death of uh, fish and benthos. The, so uh, that can also happen and then also if the proportion of nutrients also change uh, then that might also lead or impact the food web and also uh, lead to increase in the algal and then that can also affect the bird population. So you, you see these kind of range of impacts which take place. Then um, uh, whenever development takes place, we occupy land, we have land claim. So uh, and then uh, in that also leads to all these kind of changes, habitat loss, fragmentation and so on and you would see even the tourism or recreational uh, uh, activities would also lead to habitat loss, fragmentation and damage of the lateral and sublateral uh, areas. So when you really uh, take up 
the lands or uh, you have key impacts associated with the reclamation. So when you try to uh, do the reclamation, uh, like you try to take more land for the development purpose, that also has key impacts. So uh, if you look at the direct impact includes the uh, uh, intertidal uh, impact and uh, you would see that uh, there is uh, subtidal habitat loss and then uh, when that, that kind of loss happens that has implication on the birds and fish uh, feeding and then the nursing nursery grounds. So how the population grows of the birds and fish also gets impacted uh, when the reclamation happens. And then you also see when reclamation happens, there is change in the hydrodynamic process and then the pattern of sediment transport, how the sediment moves from one place to the other. Another is also impacted and then that affects the erosion and um, also affects the accretion. And then you also see that there's effect on the tidal range, what range of tidal comes there, it also affects that. And we also notice noise problem, which eventually f uh, affects uh, fish species and marine mammals. Then uh, looking at the problems associated with tourism and recreation, uh, one would see that uh, you must have traveled to a lot of places and coastal areas which are very popular in terms of uh, tourist destination. So you, you would see that there's a lot of direct impact uh, where visitors, more and more visitors come, then it really affects the sensitive ecosystem and it also affects the sand dunes in particular. So uh, you will see that when uh, the uh, vegetation over the sand dunes are damaged, often it is said that uh, to what extent it is damaged is quite possible that it's irreversible. And, uh, and then it mostly loses its, the kind of ecosystem services it provides. So if you can recollect what kind of ecosystem services we talked about. So all, all that uh, can, it can stop it can uh, like deteriorate the kind of services that uh, the area ecosystem it provides. Uh, and uh, because of a lot of infrastructure development, kind of jetties and other things you develop there, it also um, increases the disturbance uh, kind of pressure which is created over the wildlife, uh, especially birds and, um, and uh, they are especially, uh, they rely a lot uh, on um, like uh, uh, undisturbed sites for the feeding purpose. So those are disturbances happen. Uh, further, uh, we see other causes which are like uh, sea defenses, like uh, at uh, sea defenses, when we say the sea defense means uh, there are chances of uh, all kind of disasters, cyclone, typhoon and things like that. So you generally have protective walls um, and uh, water breaks and other things. Uh, uh, it can be hard structure or you can have uh, harbor walks or broad schemes and so on. So these also, when these are built, they also have primary and secondary impact. So they can impact the uh, flooding or uh, can also lead to water logging behind the structure. So wherever the structure is coming, uh, the water which used to flow into the sea ocean uh, would be blocked and it would cause flooding and water logging behind the structure. And uh, that would also lead to change in salinity, change in biota again, so those kind of things can happen. And then it would also lead to removal of tidal activity. So the uh, activity, tidal activity, which was happening without any barrier, barrier there would now be altered so or would be removed from that place. So that would also happen and uh, tidal activity currents and waves would be removed or they would be changed because of the structure which you're building there. So that would lead to another level of uh, deposition or erosion and uh, it would also lead to change in sedimentation, uh, change in the nature of uh, like uh, increasing erosion. Uh, you might also see loss of land and habitat because of erosion and flooding 
and then you, you might see uh, increasing sedimentation and you might also see damage happening to biotypes, um, uh, biotypes especially which require clear water. So you, you, we, in the previous class we studied about biotypes. So uh, looking at uh, barrage uh, types, uh, we see there are two basic categories of barrage which we see one is impermeable and permeable barrage. So one of the example is uh, Thames barrier uh, which uh, provide uh, flood defense against high tides and tidal surge. So um, uh, this, uh, they use it as per the condition and situation, so it allows a lot of flexibility. So in the picture you can see the Thames barrage which is like uh, controlling how the water waves comes and also protects the entire city from the flood or, or, or any kind of disaster risk which is there. So, um, um, uh, so th that is the uh, one example. Another example if you look at is of the impermeable barrage is uh, Cardiff Bay barrage. So uh, it uh, is uh, said like uh, so the Thames barrage is said to be uh, f uh, having lesser environmental impact since it is very flexible. But on the other hand, uh, Cardiff Bay Barrage uh, is uh, s uh, to a certain extent criticized for its environmental impact. So it uh, has uh, had uh, led to exclusion of tide and uh, also uh, uh, exclusion of tide especially for the um, amenity purpose like water spots and uh, uh, for the consistent view, waterfront development and so on. And the impact of this has been like there has been a loss of marine habitats, loss of mud flats and also loss impact on the marine coastal flora and fauna. So in the picture you can see the Cardiff uh, Bay Barrage here, you can see how the entire uh, area is divided. And uh, the another uh, uh, document which we see here from the UK government is like which uh, helps you to look at the key potential impacts of barrage. So here I have given you the link here from where you can do download this document. So uh, you can see that how uh, impacts of barrage are there like uh, in the domain of water, surface water hydrology and channel morphology, surface water quality and then how it, uh, how different phase of the project like the construction phase, the operation phase, the decommissioning phase has impact on the water environment. So you can see how during the construction phase you can have use of vehicles, machineries, they can impact the increase in the surface runoff from the soil compaction. Then you can see the change in flow velocity, increased erosion and subsequent changes, the increased flood risk and so on. So you, you can see here how it uh, is also giving you uh, like how you can use it at the, um, the diff to identify different impact that you can see what what impact will happen on land like you have landscapes, soil, geology and during the construction phase what can happen. You can have uh, creation of new, new land form, you can have visual impact. Then you would also see erosion and uh, exposure of the soil and then you would see the removal of rock by excavation work. Likewise you see all these in the operational and decommissioning phase as well. You see at the flora and fauna and then how it affects the human environment. So this, this uh, link uh, way from where you can download the document, I have given it to you. And uh, when you look at uh, permeable barrage uh, that normally takes uh, like it works on the tidal power in order to generate electricity. So uh, uh, usually they change the sedimentation pattern and reduce the uh, tidal activity upstream. So uh, they reduce that activity, so they change the tidal activity and it uh, has the potential to also increase the chances of eutrophication. You can also see uh, here uh, in the Rance estuary in France, also you can see how uh, uh, 
the, there, there are studies which tell what kind of uh, changes have happened. Then you can also look at uh, Shiva Lake uh, Tidal Power Station, uh, which is one of the largest built in the west coast of South Co Korea. You can see in the image how extensive you large scale project it is. So, you would also find those things and how it if affects uh, the environment there. So, the other uh, causes range of projects include offshore uh, renewables uh, that uh, you use uh, like you have dredging. So, that also has a lot of impact. You also uh, that also you see the alteration or removal of the tidal activity currents and waves. Uh, it also leads to altered balance between the deposition and erosion. You would see decreasing sedimentation, increasing erosion, loss of land and habitat, and increasing sedimentation. Then you would also find noise collision impacts to marine mammals, birds, fish, and benthos. So you see that. And then, um, like uh, for. Uh, because of the development of the catchment areas also, like especially in the estuaries, uh, big, uh, due to the, uh, uh, these development activities, including like uh, taking care of the urban, industrial, agriculture, forestry, uh, any construction work like dams, check dams, and so on. So that also lead to increase in the nutrition and sedimentation load. And then the ch chances of eutrophication also increases. It also increases the chances of disruption of the food webs. So, likewise, you also see uh, like uh, another important area is the offshore oil and gas exploration, ports, terminals, and shipping, marine fish farming. So, you see these activities. So, they also lead like you're seeing how how oil and gas exploration is happening. So, that also has. Uh, a direct uh, impact on pollution like uh, you have uh, organic matter, microbes, pesticides and other things getting into the water and uh, uh, because of the kind of activity happening and uh, also like uh, you have effluents which, is, which are going into the water and then there can be also incidences or accidents which can happen with the oils and other things and which is said to be one of the greatest threat uh, to the uh, ecology. Uh, so, uh, it could damage the benthic ecosystem and it could also, uh, uh, it could lead to loss of uh, life in a lo loss of wildlife, animal life, birds life uh, in the uh, coastal areas. And then you also see bioaccumulation of toxics because of these projects. And then the other cause what we see is the water abstraction. So, when uh, water is abstracted, it leads to lowering of the water table, including those in the freshwater ecosystems and wetlands, groundwater contamination by salt and pollutants through seawater intrusion. And then you will also notice some of the causes are overfishing, like you have seen all the industries we talked in the environmental status time. And then that also leads to depletion of fish stock and disruption of the food chain. So, uh, 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 these are different kind of impacts which you see from different sources. And then you might also hear about another term which is like coastal squeeze. So, there is also another problem uh, with uh, whenever the defenses or any kind of structures are built across. Uh, uh, the coastal line, so which, le which uh, wh when we say coastal squeeze, it is the loss of intertidal habit habitats due to the rising sea levels uh, and where defenses limit the ab ability of the frontage to roll back. So, because you are putting the lim uh, defense, so whatever water which comes and goes back, it is it's being stopped. So, that leads to a uh, uh, loss of intertidal habitat, which uh, puts uh, freshwater habitats into risk and then uh, uh, risk uh, which are like developed behind the sea walls. So, here uh, I have put a link to a video where you can see this coastal squeeze mechanism and you will try to 
understand how it, what's the problem and how it happens. So I've uh, given this link in the uh, suggested read and watch. So uh, looking at dredging, uh, dredging is like really uh, one of the area which has low, uh, like has uh, impact and then dredging is done for many many purpose like you have whenever you're extending the harbor you're creating the new hub ports or you're creating navigation channel or you're just maintaining those channels so uh, for that purpose the dredging for many of those purposes dredging is required so uh, when dredging is done it has several impact when you look at those impacts you see that it has uh, it increases the turbidity during uh, the works which may reduce like uh, lesser light would go and it and if lesser light would go it would uh, affect uh, the production and the visibility in the water uh, and then um, and that would also lead to changes in physiological uh, responses for some of the organism and then you also see that there might be release of toxins and nutrients and then there can be physical damage that's uh, damage also and uh, there can be also problems with the material which are released after the dredging and uh, uh, by the act of dredging itself you might uh, deepen um, the inshore waters and then you might create very sharp slopes which might um, make waves to really break through the structure and then you are exposing the area for making it more vulnerable to a uh, risk. Uh, further we see that climate change can uh, also impact all the processes. So we have been seeing how climate change, what, what are the impacts of it. So that can also change the impact. Uh, it can also impact all the processes which we are seeing. So. Uh, we would also notice that uh, because of the wind farm also there's impact and it influences the geomorphology, it influences the ecological uh, structure uh, and, uh, and it can influence, wind farm can influence uh, all, all of these uh, at the uh, different phases of its life. So uh, usually one sees that there are short term disturbances of uh, seabed during the construction of the wind farm and then uh, it might also create sediment plumes. At the landfill site, construction activities may result in short term uh, changes in the sediment budget also. So you may note the term sediment budget, how it works, uh, how much it really keeps on adding on. and. Uh, so any kind of development can uh, reduce or uh, hamper these uh, processes and decommissioning can also uh, 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 can influence but however it is considered that this decommissioning is like really the least uh, uh, threatful uh, in terms of impact. Uh, so we see that wind farm the major impact happens at the construction stage and especially from the ecological point of perspective and especially because of the local uh, disturbances which it calls and then also the piling work uh, also can um, create noise, uh, um, underground noise. So which we, if you remember we have seen it in the pre uh, very, very first week of a lecture. And then there can be chances of collision, there can be uh, changes in the fish population and then uh, it's also su uh, suggested that uh, that fish uh, commercial fish activity also has a lot of impact. Now looking at the oil and gas exploration so that uh, uh, if you look at that uh, what nature of work happens, oil and gas exploration, so where you lay pipelines, you have construction of offshores, rigs and onshore terminals and um, uh, then uh, you, uh, when the function is done it is like decommissioning also. So uh, that also causes local disturbances to the marine species and ecosystem. The biggest hazard which is seen uh, is the accidental release because uh, from the oil and gas exploration. 
So, uh, the transport of oil by ocean going uh, like tankers, the ship and all what you see is uh, said to be the most um, um, evident uh, pollution uh, which can happen and uh, that uh, mostly and it can happen because of the accidental spillage. So, we had also seen historically how we started taking care of it and then you also see ballast water and biofueling also has significant risk uh, with uh, shipping that problem also is there. And then you would find guidance in this area where you have convention and recent marine biosecurity planning guidelines. So, you can see I have given you the link from where you can look at the guidelines which are provided how you can um, uh, do all kind of um, uh, identification and assessment. And then you would also find uh, the national ballast water management requirements. So, here again you can see this. And then the other cause is the marine farming and in India particularly it is important in Kerala area and uh, the tide is used to help harvest like shrimps and like there are 75 percent of the farm shrimp is produced in, uh, in the uh, Asia and China and Thailand on all, all these eastern areas. So, that is also caused a lot of, uh, that also has impact. So, we had seen range of impact uh, when we studied about the environmental status. Uh, so, marine farm uh, that has high potential to lower the water quality. So, it can impact the water quality uh, because of the cages which are created and uh, one relies on chemicals and pest control and so on, a lot of medication which happens. So, this uh, water quality goes down and then um, and then you can have uh, pollution of water uh, uh, columns and then you can also see seabed pollution and then uh, this is also noticed that the parasitic lice uh, like they can be parasite also and then there have been cases where fishes uh, salmon fishes have died because of the increase in lice and other things and then the water abstraction also you can see has impact water abstraction, it uh, leads to saline water intrusion and saline water intrusion, intrusion can have other kind of impact. So, you can have, uh, um, it can lead to pollution um, in the sea water, then you can also have, it, it can also affect the biota of marine a maritime uh, uh, fresh or the brackish water habitats, then you can also have uh, like a, a cumulative impact where uh, abstraction as well as infrastructure, they can also cause a lot of other things and uh, one notable thing is the sinking of the land uh, to the sea level which also we had studied before. So, all these can lead to that. So, uh, uh, this uh, manual by ILFS, uh, by the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Government of India. So, if you will see that uh, you uh, undertake all these information like uh, the, the basic information about the project in base, uh, you can see in number one. Number two, you would see all the kinds of natures of activity which goes and it provides you with the information check checklist confirmation and then you see what kind of natural resources are used for construction of the operation of the project, use of storage, transport, handling of production, uh, production of solid waste during construction or of operational decommissioning and then the release of pollutants, any hazardous, toxic or non-noxious uh, substance to air. Then you can see generation of noise and vibration and emission of uh, light and heat. You can see risk of contamination of land or water from release of pollutants into ground into sievers. Then risk of accidents, factors which should be considered. So, you can uh, consider such as um, uh, uh, consequential development because of uh, one development other developments would happen. So, cumulative impact. So, uh, you can see the lead to development of supporting facilities, all the ancillary facilities which might come. And, uh, and then uh, if you look at the choice of methods for prediction of impact, you would, uh, it also provides you that. Uh, so, you have, 
for, for the water environment, you see estuary models, estuarial dynamic models. So we have seen this briefly within a water environment also. So dynamic water quality models. So you can see this. Uh, I'll be sharing this document with you. And HEC2, SMS, all these gives, gives you modeling choices like uh, uh, model you, which you can create to um, do the um, assessment. So looking at the methods of impact prediction and assessment, so you see that the choice of methods for prediction of impact for water environment has been pro provided by the manual. So you can look at the estuary models. Uh, and then dynamic water quality model, HEC model, SMC models, which are there. So uh, if you'll see how they are applied, it stimulates tides, currents, discharge in the shallow, vertically mixed estuaries. So these models are available. And uh, like you will see dynamic water quality model, it stimulates the mass transport of either conservative or non-conservative quality, uh, how, how uh, that entire hydrodynamic model will work. And then you have HEC2 to compute water surface profile uh, in the steady situation, gradually varying flow in both uh, different kinds of channels which are there. And then what kind of what, uh, circulation, salt water intrusions would happen. So all these models can uh, undertake that work. And then uh, you have models for noise environment uh, impact assessment also within this. So you can see Federal Highway Administration, FHWA has a model which helps you to noise impact due to the vehicular movement that you can see. Then you also have Dhwani model and then you also have hemispherical sound wave propagation um, airport. Uh, that, is, that model is also there. Then you would also find... Uh, model for uh, land environment. So you have digital analysis technique, ranking analysis for soil suitability criteria. So uh, this can be used. Then you also have for biological environments like sample plot methods. So we have seen these transactive line intercept methods, plot list sampling methods, spe species list method, direct contact method. So all these we have seen. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this uh, example also, case study also with you. So you have this uh, image, you can see Sacramento River flow reduction analysis, which they have done. So diversion from uh, how, what kind of fish passage would be created. So you, in the figure, you can see simulated operation period and rated flow through fish passage. So they are working on the different scenarios. Scenario one, you can see. And how that, uh, like by year-wise, 1970, 1971, and so on, 2015, what kind of change uh, would happen, uh, a flow range of passage would happen. So in uh, month-wise, also on the left-hand side, uh, vertical axis, you can see the variations. And then in this, again, through this report, you can see... Uh, how they are working out the flow reduction analysis. So you can see how within all months, Jan, Feb, March, April, what kind of flow reduction would happen in the wet, above normal, below normal scenario. And then the, you can see uh, which are the considerable uh, variations as per the scenario. So uh, uh, the, these models are used, so you are familiar with those models now. So once you identify the impact, you undertake impact assessment. So now you need to really understand how significant is that impact. So an impact uh, arise, uh, and whenever, there might be a lot of things happening, but the impact happens when a particular effect interacts with the receptor. And those changes can be positive or that can be negative. So, so that is what you check. And, uh, and especially in the impact assessment stage for coastal or marine ecological assessments, you uh, look at the nature or the magnitude of what kind of impact is going to happen, what's the nature of the impact, how sensitive is the receiving environment, and that uh, all understanding you have to develop. 
So while looking at that, you look at these questions and you remember how we have looked at these questions before also. So while assessing that, you look at it. So what's the scale of change which is happening uh, uh, and will it, uh, how, uh, how much is the change? Then the spatial extent and what kind of duration is there? And whether that is reversible or not, what's the frequency of the change and what's the likelihood of whatever change you're thinking of that might happen. And then looking at uh, the uh, receptors thing, so how vulnerable is the receptor, how sensitive or intolerant the receptors are. So uh, just to quickly revisit what really sensitivity means and what does recoverability means, we have seen all that in our previous session. So you also see that uh, there are a lot of uh, criteria which are used to determine and look at uh, uh, to assess the impact, so whether they are significant or not. So like here in the table you can see whether, whether the magnitude uh, of the impact, whether it's high or not, uh, not, you have certain sets of questions. So here you can see, I, I'm just going to uh, tell about one of that parameter. So the quality and availability of habitat and species are degraded to the extent that locally rare population and habitats are destroyed and protected species and habitat experience wide, widespread change such that the integrity of the ecosystem and conservation status of the designation may be compromised. So in such situation, you consider that to be high. So it is going to change, the integrity will be uh, disturbed and it will be compromised and the impact would be considered high. So likewise, you would look at where the uh, uh, where uh, integrity is not much compromised, it would be considered as medium and where it is, uh, uh, where it is uh, uh, recoverable, then it would be low and then a certain extent very low. So uh, you, you see that uh, you look at those questions and same way you have another example where you look at the sensitivity of the uh, receptor. So you also see what, when do you see, uh, see that the, there is high sensitivity. So you look at uh, a receptor, uh, what's the uh, key characteristic uh, of those receptor, are they distinctive or not and are they like specially protected areas or sp protected species. So what what is the value of it and how sensitive are those receptors? Can they adapt to the change or not? So if not, then, then their value would be high. So likewise, you have certain medium uh, where you will say the impact is medium when the value is relatively low and then the sensitivity wise, they have the capacity to accommodate to the changes. So likewise, you will see the impact is low when the value are uh, of local importance and not designated anything and then uh, the sensitivity wise also they are able to tolerate and they are able to adapt to the changes given and similarly very low. So that is how you would uh, have uh, parameters to evaluate all, all the significance. So here, as per the manual, you can see how they are looking at the environmental sensitivity, again taken from the ship breaking yard example. So you would look at certain parameters given here. In the Indian scenario, so you have areas protected under international conventions, so uh, they, you would uh, consider it to be more sensitive and so on. So areas which are important or sensitive, areas which used by protected important or sensitive species, inland, coastal, marine or underground water and uh, what all things uh, have to be taken care of. So these sensitivity is also given. And then uh, you would also use the current and historic data to understand this. So I've taken this snip from the a case example of Sacramento River. So you, here you can see how they are putting their data to understand the historical perspective. Here also again you can see the historical data on how the changes are happening. So there's another example you can see how you can uh, look at the impact which happens on the receptor. So you, you look at the different magnitude, you describe uh, the nature of the receptor and look at the magnitude. And then uh, you also find a framework uh, which is there uh, to check this. 
So you, you can uh, see this uh, put a decision making framework, how do you decide whether it is important, not important. So one of the framework has been given here. So even that can be referred here. And then there is another uh, um, framework approach which is given which is like Rochdell envelope which is also very much used in the environmental impact assessments. So, so that can also be used here. So the link to this document I have provided this for you. So uh, that is what uh, we saw about uh, coastal area, what, uh, what are the different impacts and then uh, how, what kind of models are used and then uh, uh, what kind of questions you ask to really uh, see the impact, magnitude and significance and the sensitivity of the receptor. So what did we cover today? We covered the sources and types of impacts for coastal areas Then we looked at the methods for impact predictions and assessment. So that was the coverage for today. And this was the key reference, uh, the book, uh, Terrible and Boots book, which is our textbook. And then you know, there are suggested readings and watch like all the phenomenon and cases which we could not discuss all of them but then they have been given here so that you can look at those videos separately if you are interested. So we will uh, wind up there so please feel free to ask questions let us know about any concerns you have do share your opinions experiences and suggestions looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring AIE. Thank you.